Hello, I'm Jeff Sachs. Welcome to uh, Book Club and conversations with the leading thinkers and authors from around the world. And today I'm absolutely uh, delighted, uh, really thrilled to have uh, uh, together in conversation uh, Professor Patricia Sullivan, uh, who is the William Arthur Ferry, the second professor of history at the University of South Carolina and one of America's leading historians and great experts uh, in uh, all of the uh, challenges of race and civil rights and civil rights movement and uh, modern America. Uh, Professor Sullivan has been writing about these topics in many, many important histories, but today we are talking about her new book, uh, which is uh, Justice Rising, Robert Kennedy's America in Black and White. And I uh, was so thrilled, Pat, to read your new book. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy was uh, my first uh, political uh, hero. Uh, I was 14 when he ran for president, uh, and uh, it, he, he was my candidate and his assassination was uh, one of the defining moments of my life as it was for so many Americans. Uh, mm -hmm. I, and uh, I have always uh, cherished his leadership and memory and your book added immensely to my understanding of RFK and uh, many of his unique uh, characteristics, noble characteristics, I think that we're going to speak about. Uh, so welcome. Uh, thank you for writing the book. Thank you for being together in the conversation. Why did you write this book at this time? You've been, of course, writing about topics of race and uh, civil rights in America uh, throughout your career. Why RFK and, and why now? Well, that's a great question. And I just want to thank you, uh, Jeff, uh, for inviting me and uh, for all that you do. And uh, and you know, I, you came to mind as I was finishing the book because you really, uh, your work reflects so much of what uh, Robert Kennedy cared about and worked for. And for me, as a historian of civil rights and the African American experience since the Civil War in the United States, Robert Kennedy was was sort of a surprising topic uh, for for me to focus on. Um, as you mentioned, I've written a number of books that explore race and politics and civil rights struggles across the century, 20th century. And um, my last book was on the NAACP, uh, our oldest civil rights organization. And I looked at from its founding in 1909 up through the 1950s. And that was an amazing history of how uh, African-Americans and, and those believing in racial justice and democracy uh, struggled, continued to struggle, even in the midst of segregation and all the barriers that they faced. And, and made significant headway. The legal struggle that culminated with Brown in 1954 was a 20 year long, really grassroots effort uh, where lawyers worked with these communities. So it really opened up uh, this dynamic history. And by the time I finished that book, I thought I wanted to take a fresh look at the 1960s in light of what I'd learned. And um, as, you know, not just as a, decade that went from civil rights to black power, but a decade of dramatic racial change and struggle, which uh, ended segregation and then opened up the great challenges this country faced from its long history of slavery and then Jim Crow. And so as I was reading around and thinking about it and having big ideas, you know, Robert Kennedy kept showing up and, and I, I didn't know enough about him. I knew the general, whatever, you know, a great guy and, you know, but. He did, I didn't see him as central. Well, he moved to the center of my work because he was someone in his time which had the, I mean, he, he responded not only to the demands that the civil rights movement really brought to the center of America, America's attention after the sit-ins, but the opportunities uh, that created for our country to, uh, to really look at our history and, and, and embark on what many have called a second reconstruction, you know, ending segregation and then really dealing with the deep problems of racial inequality that has that grew up across our history. Um, so he became my way in and 
for for uh, for some of us uh, of of my age, uh, he he's uh, you know a, a vivid figure. But for younger people who may not know much about Robert Kennedy, uh, I'm sure people uh, know of him, but maybe mm -hmm. really don't know the roles that he played and mm -hmm. and in fact why he kept showing up. Maybe you could lay out just a little bit of. Uh, of Robert Kennedy's uh, life up into the point where you pick it up in 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 this book, uh, he's obviously the brother of John F. Kennedy. Uh, President Kennedy came into office uh, uh, January twentieth, uh, nineteen sixty one, and appointed his kid brother as Attorney General. So maybe maybe you can tell us a, a bit about uh, Robert at that stage, a very young man indeed. Very. Yeah, well, you know, my question when I saw how um, extraordinarily responsive and engaged he was with the issues of racial justice, who is he? How did he, how, how was he ready for this moment? And um, so, I, you know, I looked at his early life and I think there's some really interesting characteristics about Robert Kennedy. He was born in 1925. Um, he, you know, came of age during the World War II era which were very, you know, disruptive in, in all good kind of ways in this country. And, um, but, but as a young person, you know, his teachers, he had a questioning spirit. You know, he um, was not a great student, but he always wanted to know why. Um, he had, a, I think, a, a kind of faith, a uh, religious faith that was truly uh, um, humanitarian, I, I would say, you know, that, that so he had he had experiences and characteristics that uh, I explored. And as he's growing up and, and coming into his adulthood, um, you know, again, these changes are happening in our country, the great migration and you know, the cities are changing. But anyhow, um, he, uh, I guess, uh, a, a few defining moments as he as he grows older, um, he, you know, went to college at Harvard, and then his father sent him uh, abroad uh, as a, to work for a newspaper uh, just to get him exposure to, you know, life and, and what was happening in Europe after the war. And he was in the Middle East when Israel was founded, and, and he's reporting from the Middle East as like a 21-year-old guy and talking to Palestinians and, um, you know, uh, Jewish people, you know, fighting for a homeland. And he, he really sees the complexity and, 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 and listens to both sides and sees the challenges. So he's someone who's open and curious and concerned about humanity across barriers, you know. I think so it's worth, uh, worth pointing out just uh, again for pe people listening that the father, uh, Joe Kennedy, of course, was uh, by then uh, a, a very rich uh, uh, and, and famous uh, figure who had been uh, ambassador to the UK uh, in the 1930s, a controversial figure. Uh, he'd been a part of uh, FDR's New Deal. And of right. course, it's the Kennedy children uh, who go on to uh, this uh, uh, greatness uh, of role in American life. But uh, both John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy, as you said, very early on were given opportunities by their dad, uh, go see the world. Uh, John Kennedy uh, in Europe uh, at the end of the 1930s, and then of course uh, mm -hmm. fighting in World War II, and Robert Kennedy mm -hmm. suddenly as a reporter at the birth of uh, the State of Israel and, and the Middle East uh, tribulations uh, after World War II. So they're exposed to a broad world mm -hmm. at a young age, which makes it possible for them to become leaders at a remarkably young age. Exactly, very important point. And they're seeing these uh, anti-colonial movements and struggles and, 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 and really seeing what they're about in terms of the poverty and, and uh, so open. And, and I think, and that's a very important point you raised, Jeff, that they had the opportunity, thanks to their father and, and their background to, to have these experiences, but, you know, but it, they, they they absorb so much through that experience. And I guess one last thing I'll say about Kennedy before coming to um, the point of the, you know, the book when he moves on to the national stage with his brother is that there was an incident at the University of Virginia in 1951 that really was curious to me. Uh, he was a, a law student at UVA. And again, segregation was the law in the South. I mean, you couldn't have not, 
public meetings had to be segregated. It, it was just, you know, for listeners, especially younger listeners, you and I sort of remember we were very young as it broke up, but segregation was uh, so deeply entrenched and, and enforced. It was an apartheid society. It was an apartheid society. And so when he was at Virginia, because of his trip to the Middle East, um, he was the head of a law group that invited speakers. And Ralph Bunch had won the Nobel Peace Prize, great African-American political scientist. He was a civil rights activist in his own right, and now uh, represented for the US to the UN. And he won the Nobel Peace Prize for the settling the first Arab-Israeli war, for his role in that. So Kennedy invited him to come to UVA. And, uh, and Ralph a Bunch said he would come, but only if it was not segregated. And so Kennedy said, okay. And he started to arrange that. And it wasn't so easy because it was the law. And his professor said, well, we'll put the signs up, but people, you know, we won't enforce them. He said, no, no signs. I mean, he said not. So he writes to the president of the University of Virginia. It's a beautiful letter. It's talking about two NAACP cases, talking about the war and why Ralph Bunch should be welcome to the University of Virginia in openly. And Darden agreed. And 1,500 people came. A, a third were African-American. First, really from all I can find, the first integrated meeting on the campus of the University of Virginia of that size. In 51, and we talked about that later. And this is, you know, he, he didn't say, oh, well, I did that. He mentioned it like as an aside. It's an extraordinary said, thing, by the way. And it's part of the nat, I, I think, if I might say, part of the natural grace of Robert Kennedy that it, for him, well, yeah, we'll have a desegregated meeting. It, it just seems so natural. Yeah, that's right. It was the right thing to do, you know, even, and, 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 and he and Ralph Bunch and Ethel became lifelong friends. I mean, they, they had a, they, he stayed with Ethel and Bobby, newlyweds, because there was no place for this great Nobel Prize winning uh, <laughs> diplomat to stay in Charlottesville. You know, all the hotels were segregated. Um, and, and so that just showed that he was open and, and when the opportunities presented, but again, he went through the 50s and, and worked in government and on Senate committees and, and segregation was the norm. And, and you know that was that. But then he moves into national life uh, in a big way with his brother's campaign. And uh, and as you point out, Jeff, his brother appoints him to be attorney general um, at a moment when the Justice Department will be at the center of this revolution that is really taking off in the South uh, with the sit-in movement. And, and you know, he was appointed at age 36. Uh, I think, uh, of course, Kennedy was, what are you doing? Uh, they asked the president, he said, I'm trying to give my, my kid brother some experience <laughs> in, right, in, right. in the law. I think we would be horrified today if such a thing happened. Uh, it, the backlash would be enormous. But at the time, it seemed, OK, the president wants a close advisor. So he puts in his kid brother. And it seemed. It was a little controversial, but it seemed okay. Is that right? Is that fair to say? Well, but you're right. It was controversial. You know, people said, well, he has experience and he hasn't been in court. And what John Kennedy said, uh, he said that he, you know, he ran his brother's Senate campaign in 1952 and did a brilliant job. And he said, he, no one, he gets the best people. He can get the job done. There's no one better than him. And he also said he knew race was going to be the major issue they were facing. They, they didn't know the dimensions of it. It's just kind of coming to the fore. And he said, the president said, we're going to have to change the climate in this country. I need someone I can trust. And they need someone who's going to tell me the truth. And he was so correct about his brother. But you're right, there was pushback. But Alexander Bickle, who was one of the, you know, he did a column in The Nation. He came around very quickly and said, these people are public servants of the highest order. I mean, the team he built in the Justice Department, these amazing lawyers he brought in, uh, John Doerr was there, but Burke Marshall, and who really, you know, What is incredible is that the, the people that he brought in became uh, leading figures for 50 years onward. Uh, they became right. the preeminent uh, moral leaders in the country for decades onward. No, that is extraordinary, actually. It's not how normally our Justice Department works. We're not going to remember the Bar Justice Department uh, for decades to come, except uh, for its abuses, uh, perhaps. But with RFK, uh, 
this point, I just maybe you could elaborate on it a little bit. He, he and John surrounded themselves with excellent people. Is it just as a normal part of their strategy of leadership? That is so important. Um, you know, we think of the Kennedys of iconic figures, and they get sort of detached from from their environment, and that. You know, they wanted the best people in terms of you know, intelligence, commitment to public service. Um, and when you look at, the, you know, there was nothing quite like the Justice Department before or since. I mean, it, it was, that's one example, but throughout the administration, and they, they were confident, they wanted smart people around them. They wanted people to argue with them, right? To present different points of view and to work that through in dealing with really, huge challenges in terms of foreign policy and domestic policy. And it, it really is one of the great um, legacies, as you point out, because these people go on and they're involved in public life beyond this moment. But, but it's really, to me, was one of the great eye openers as I, as I looked at Robert Kennedy in the context of, of President Kennedy's administration. So the, the early 1960s, uh, it seems a long way off, but it's, uh... For those of us, again, who lived through it, it seems so current uh, completely because we continue to debate and be divided by these issues for decades uh, afterwards. Uh, up until today, we're still debating race, voting rights, schooling, the works. Uh, it's, uh, it, it is uh, our, our daily lives in America. Can you uh, help uh, us understand your book uh, does a beautiful job of it. The tensions and the, the drama of that period, especially as it hit RFK, who was the chief law enforcement officer of the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's I mean, a lot. And it's, it's hard, hard to imagine that the, the, the tense, well, the, the profound divisions of that moment. But you know, when you compare it to that, there's really interesting parallels. One thing, just a little sidebar, what we spoke about earlier, they also saw how white the administration was and they really began bringing in African-Americans into government at all levels and, and acting, acting as they could. But like today, they function within a political context, a Congress dominated by Southern Democrats, deeply committed to segregation um, and, uh, and it, so it was, it was a slight Democratic majority, but with all with these Southern Democrats who were um, opposed to any change. And at the same time, this movement, you know, like I say, just demanding, you know, just this not going to stop. I mean, African Americans have been struggling for decades, but the sit-ins really opened things up, and people around the country, young people, responded to the sit-ins. So you have the sit-ins, you have the Southern Democrats, and then you have these encounters in, in the South. I mean, there's things happening in the North. I mean, the Freedom Rides is a great example. I mean, as soon as Robert Kennedy came in, he and Marshall, they put the Justice Department behind enforcing school desegregation rulings. I mean, Brown was decided seven years earlier and very few schools were integrated. Voting rights, using- so just, just, to, just to remind all of the, uh, the, the, the listeners, uh, Brown versus Board of Education was the 1954 Supreme Court ruling uh, that said uh, separate but equal education, segregated education was inherently unequal and therefore inherently unconstitutional, uh, but it had not been enforced. Uh, and in fact, it would take decades of, uh, uh, of a debate and rancor about what enforcement meant. So in the early 60s, the question of board versus Brown of education, in other words, desegregating American schools was very high on the agenda and schools at all levels from elementary school to universities which did not have black students in in the south no yeah i mean some did but again you had those big conflicts under the kennedys mississippi alabama and they pushed that through they insisted they enforced it uh, and began using the tools they had to enforce voting rights and really working with SNCC people in the field who are getting people to go and try to register. But when the Freedom Rides came in 1961, what both Kennedys saw, I mean, people who had supported them, John Patterson, who's governor of Alabama, they saw that as these young people, black and white, attempted to ride to the South, based on a Supreme Court ruling said, you could not segregate in interstate travel. 
and the violence that met them while the governor and the sort of basically condoned it. It wouldn't, would not interfere and in putting these lives at risk and really forcing the federal government to deal with these state federal issues and try to protect these riders and enforce the law. And when they got through Alabama, where there were, you know, buses were firebombed, mobs met these riders at bus stations. Uh, Robert Kennedy sent in federal marshals and, and really helped uh, avoid a disaster at this mass meeting at church where King was. But, but at the end of that, he turned to John Doerr and he said, those fellows are at war with this country, right? The governor, <laughs> the local elected officials. And I sort of think about that today when we see what's tolerated, you know, with what happened on January 6th. I mean, this, what do you do when law breaks down, when, when, when law enforcement people aren't enforcing law? So this is all churning. At the same time, Robert Kennedy is attentive to, to poverty in cities. And in 1961, he walks up to East Harlem and meets with some gang members. He's concerned about criminal justice issues and, and young people caught up in the criminal justice system and really starts to see a, the deeper problems beyond just eliminated segregation in the South. What has happened in cities where African-Americans have been migrating for decades and uh, segregated living in poverty uh, poor schools and the rest. So all of this is in there, <laughs> on their plate. And, and, and they're using, I mean, what impressed me, they're finding ways, tools to use to try to begin to deal with these problems and work with communities in addressing these problems and showing the federal government as an ally uh, in the midst of resistance in Congress and, and all other kinds of roadblocks. So it's sort of changing the dynamic um, and, and really, pressing them to figure out what they could do to get legislation through and really begin to turn the country around. As John Kennedy said, to change the climate in this country, a country that had been built on racial segregation in the aftermath of the Civil War um, and with all these consequences. One of the, uh, two, two of the things that impressed me about all, all of it, one is uh, how much learning uh, they went through and how much learning was needed because I think the grim realities of life in slum settings, in poverty, in, in the deep south were not really known uh, outside of uh, those uh, venues, not to, uh, not, not to the Kennedys and not to so many people. Uh, so it was a constant uh, education, uh, first of all, and, and also famously just as uh, it's said of John F. Kennedy in West Virginia primary in 1960, how his eyes were opened to the extreme poverty in the United States. Uh, and it was being on the ground and they were both politicians that soared, but also were on the ground in the most local encounters. And so I think that that's extremely uh, important. The other thing that is so uh, striking about all of the events is both John and Robert Kennedy take in, in with such good faith, of course, people will follow the law. This is the, the court said so. So of course, governor, you will do the following. Mm -hmm. They don't want to bring the National Guard out. They don't want to have to do these things. They trust in the rule of law. But the other side does not play by the rule of law. And this is part of the remarkable tension all along, because not only is there the constraint of a Democratic Party divided between the racists, the segregationists, uh, and, uh, and, and, the, and the liberals, and so it's hard enough to get votes, but uh, it, it, with this fraught environment, the Kennedys, both of them, were constantly appealing can we just please do this in a civilized way? What are you doing to oppose a court order? Do we really have to bring bayonets out onto the streets? And it's a, such a fascinating, uh, difficult period because they're, they're always pressing for the goodwill to prevail, but the goodwill doesn't always prevail. Well, they're, they're pressing for the goodwill to prevail, but they're also enforcing the law. Yes. And, and, and 
Yeah. But I think, you know, because again, this, before I wrote this book, why didn't they do more? You know, when you send in force, right? And these people like George Wallace, and, and he's a famous name, but so many of the people resisting the law, I mean, elected officials and public officials, they're appealing to the fears of, you know, they're, they're really <laughs> appealing to the fears and resentments of, of many white people. And that raises the tension. You know, once you send in, uh, I mean, how do you bring people along? I mean, you've got to enforce the law and protect, in the case of Mississippi, James Meredith. But they knew James Meredith was going to enter the University of Mississippi. The court had ruled and the governor, you know, and there was a riot, you know, I mean, there was a massive riot on the campus, thousands of people, two people were killed. James Meredith did enter, uh, the army did come and restore order, but it really showed the lengths that people would go to and, and how political, you know, politicians so opportunistic and using these moments to build resistance, right? To encourage people, to let people think they don't have to follow the federal law. And I think it's a great lesson for today because in the end, they appeal to people and they, and they trusted the humanity of people. And, and I think if you read John Kennedy's civil rights speech, the way they talk to our country, to our fellow citizens is very powerful. Uh, but at the same time, they did what uh, had to be done to push things forward. And they really supported and, and uh, became aligned with the, the civil rights movement, the black freedom movement. They really, uh, you know, cause that was the energy in our country which was really pushing for the enforcement of law, for voting rights, to open the country up, uh, not just racially, but democratically. Uh, and so the Kennedys became sort of aligned with that effort. And that was where the energy was coming to really push the country forward. So I think that combination of that sort of leadership in Washington and the work of people on the ground, um, black and white, uh, was a, remarkable dynamic and it's really what gets us to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I mean that that sort of uh, work. You mentioned the civil rights speech. I, I want to uh, encourage uh, everybody to go online and listen to the speech on uh, June 11, 1963. Uh, I've listened to it uh, I think uh, perhaps a hundred times uh, mm -hmm. or more. Uh, it's one of the most scintillating important speeches uh, in American history by President uh, John F. Kennedy. Uh, I know it uh, in part because I wrote a book about a speech that he gave the day before, right. uh, which is a speech on international peace, uh, which I regard as one of the greatest speeches uh, ever given by an American president about uh, global cooperation. That was on June 10. 1963, the American uh, uh, University commencement address. And the very next day, he, he hits another grand slam home run for uh, American baseball fans. It's just unbelievably powerful speech uh, where he says that the issues that we confront are as old as the scriptures and as clear as the American constitution. Uh, he puts race, I think, for the first time, really. Am I right, uh, yes. Pat? For the first time by an American president on the moral plane, on this high yes. moral plane, language that is stunning, mm -hmm. still to listen to uh, after more than half a century. So I encourage everybody to, to listen to it. Uh, and, and I also, they were scrambling so much in those two days the speech wasn't even finished as the cameras went on at 7 p.m., just as we were starting our Zoom the same way. Right. And then President Kennedy was getting notes and he improvised the end of the speech, actually. So the whole thing is unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> and, and, you know, as they, Burke Marshall said, he knew what he was going to say. He felt it. He knew it by then after those years. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a remarkable speech and with that speech he, he says I will introduce major civil rights legislation segregation has no place in American life and you know that then that moves forward your book opens with a remarkable story of, of an encounter uh, that Harry Belafonte uh, arranges and James Baldwin arranges of Robert Kennedy uh, a few blocks from uh, where I am right now uh, uh, Mm -hmm. a meeting at Central Park South uh, 
where uh, it actually turns into a pretty tense meeting. But I thought it, it was a perfect opener to explain the different points of view of America and the tensions uh, and this remarkable learning process. Could you uh, paint the scene a bit because it's, it is a remarkable story. Well, the meeting, uh, it is a remarkable story. It's, it's sort of a pivot in the book and it uh, happens in late May, 1963. And that is the high point, the Birmingham protests that Dr. King had orchestrated had exploded and the people had seen the police dogs be turned on young protesters. So the country, and there were protests throughout the country. I mean, things, the lid had come off. And uh, so uh, Robert Kennedy had an invitation to meet with James Baldwin. He had read uh, he, the fire next time. He, he knew Baldwin's work. He, he really was impressed with how Baldwin captured the racial, uh, more than problems, you know, just tensions and, and, and where we were. We were at like sort of the precipice uh, throughout the country. So he meets with this group and he's looking to them to help him them understand what to do about the North. I mean, they're moving on the South, but so he's looking for advice. And a uh, number of you know, noted artists and, and uh, public figures are there. And uh, the it's, meeting, not a, it's not a warm reception. Well, it's not because again, it reflects to me the moment. Yes. You know? I mean, Kennedy comes in, he knows a lot. He knows things are really bad. And these folks come in and one of them is a freedom rider. One of them is Jerome Smith who had been in the movement for three years and all of the violence and beatings. So he's like a soldier coming from the front lines. And he looks at Kennedy and what he sees, Kennedy represents, you know, white America, the government. And he just is angry that more hasn't been done. And Kennedy's trying to explain, you know, what they're trying to do and they're, and the thing just goes off and it becomes an opportunity for people to unload on him as being representative of a politics that's too slow. And, and it really is a painful, I mean, Kenneth Clark said it was the most painful, violent encounter he'd ever been part of. It went on for three hours. And halfway through, Robert Kennedy stopped talking and he just listened. And it was um, not pleasant, uh, but it just captured the racial divide and uh, not him personally, but what he represented and, and this opportunity to tell the second highest person in government, you know, tell him off and, and what, what the problem was, what they had, what especially with Jerome Smith had experienced. So, I mean, it was, uh, and I think Baldwin said later, it just represented this, when white and black meet this kind of, you know, they bring different experiences to the conversation. And it's very hard to get at a place where you totally understand each other. Um, so it, and it's, it's, all, it's also the, the classic struggle. Uh, Kennedy saying we're doing our best politics is hard. And the other uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the African-American leaders saying, sorry, that best uh, is not accomplishing what we yeah. need. Exactly. Uh, that's awful. Uh, and we can't wait. Uh, and it was, of course, uh, the ongoing uh, great tension with Mar Martin Luther King also, who is, of course, pushing, pushing, pushing. Uh, and the Kennedys are saying, don't push so hard. It's going to make it hard. And, uh, and and Martin Luther King said, well, we've been waiting uh, hundreds of years. <laughs> Sorry, uh, this is not the, the moment not to push. No, exactly. No, it, it, it really, uh, it, the Kennedys are part of a much larger drama. And, 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 and sort of transition that's happening in the 60s. And, and I think what, what I learned in writing this book is that both sides are, are correct. And, but you know, they, had a, they had a deal in the political reality of how do you get a bill through Congress? You know, the president can't just wave a wand. Um, but I think this, you know, these encounters really show uh, how tough it, it was. And, yeah, they, people should be impatient and demanding. Meanwhile, they're trying to do what they can do. And, and I think the thing about King, and, and we'll probably talk about this a little later, but you know, he becomes much more closely aligned, he and Robert Kennedy, around the issues of race and poverty as we move into the later 1960s. Uh, and even Baldwin looks back at Robert Kennedy after he dies and said he was someone in the 20th century with enough passion and energy and patience. He had a mind that could be reached. Yep. And that 
is um so i was going to say the next uh, three years uh, uh the next five years i should say uh, uh from the time of that speech uh, to uh, robert kennedy's death it's it's like a century of uh, history in those five years i don't know if america's ever had such five tumultuous yeah. years between 1963 and 1968 mm -hmm. Perhaps mm -hmm. never, uh, other than maybe the Civil War would be the only right and uh, reconstruction. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and the only uh, comparable period. But mm -hmm. uh, in in a limited time, can you give us a a sense of how history accelerated phenomenally, both uh, for the nation and for Robert Kennedy uh, in in the period? This, of course, is the core of, of the book. Right. Uh, you know, it it but every day is like a lifetime lived because of the drama and acceleration of, of change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, well, you know, the Civil Rights Act, um, which they put together and, and, and figure out the, this sort of re getting, rep they figure out how to get a, a strong civil rights bill through. But by then, Robert Kennedy knew they needed a civil rights law that would end legal segregation, legally mandated segregation, but that a law could not, would never be sufficient to deal with the problems and the racial inequalities in this country. So he understood that. And again, he's in tune with what Baldwin's writing, what he's seeing in cities and in the, uh, with the American public. And so by the time John Kennedy goes to, to Texas, uh, what will be the Civil Rights Act and is, is written and ready. And the, and the coalition that will get it through, the Kennedys really, that's their act. I mean, Lyndon Johnson takes it to the finish line and signs it. So he leaves for Texas on November 20th, and that's in place. And to me, that's very important. In two and a half years, they had figured out and, and, and put together a strategy for getting a major civil rights bill through that we would have signed in July of 64. But after the bill is signed, I mean, within two weeks of the signing of the Civil Rights Act, Harlem explodes, right? A police shooting of a 15-year-old high school student um, just sets things off. And um, with this encounter between police and, and, and when you have sort of an uprising that lasts for several days. And there are several that summer, which really are an expression of frustration and anger about the conditions in urban areas. And these encounters or these uprisings are triggered by a, an incident with the police, but it really is much deeper. And so as we get the Civil Rights Act, we're moving into that territory. And then next year after the Voting Rights Act, um, you have the major, uh, Watts uprising in August of 65. By this time, Kennedy understands, Robert Kennedy understands what this is about. And um, in the immediate, and he's, again, he's seeing it, you know, in 63, he and John Kennedy both talk about a hundred years, you know, of, of delay, linking us back to reconstruction and the amendments that secured citizenship and voting rights for African-Americans totally undone by segregation and what happens around the country. So this is all bursting forth. And um, so the dam bursts, the hundred years of delay uh, explodes uh, in uh, all of the economic, of social, racial, political, everything, every possible cleavage in society uh, and, and, in and exactly that period. What they show, it's not, it wasn't just a Southern thing at all. You know, it was national. And, and, and again, right after these acts come, almost symbolic, you get these uprisings in, in cities. And after Watts, um, many politicians started to call for law and order. That was their response just immediately. And Robert Kennedy said, how can you ask Negroes, the term used then, or I think it's African-Americans to obey the law when the law is used against them? And he wasn't just talking about policing. He was talking about landlords that cheated people, merchants that cheated people, you know, just not having access. He said, the law doesn't mean the same to black people as it does to white people. And these conditions, we have to face them. And I think what's fascinating about this volatile period is that many people shared that and they felt there was an opening to begin to deal with the deep consequences of racial segregation. Uh, particularly as it was uh, played out in these cities where people were had been segregated into 
uh, ghetto conditions with terrible housing, no good access to education, high unemployment, and young people just seeing no way out. And, and what's, it, to me, interesting about that, if you follow Robert Kennedy, you see the people trying to address these issues, Dr. King being a major one who goes to Chicago and seeing the interconnection between race and poverty and economic justice. And, um, and, and, and in 66, which is a really interesting year that I wrote about, as you say, Jeff, there's something happening almost every day, but, but the you know, hearings in the Senate, field hearings out going around exposing these conditions uh, and the sense that they could turn things in a new direction. I mean, there was really a feeling uh, that that could happen because you know, the civil rights struggle, which ignited young act activism throughout the country, unlike any period since the New Deal, there's a tremendous energy in our country to address these issues, to work to end poverty, to work to end racial discrimination. So even though by the end of the 60s, things have really taken a, a really bad turn, there's great hope and people like Robert Kennedy devoting his effort and working with people, as you say, he was had a capacity to attract people, find people who were uh, shared these concerns and really build, try to build a new kind of politics that was pushing against this rising white backlash. So I think that it's important, uh, It's it, it is remarkable, uh, and I think we should highlight it, the, the fact that the race issues uh, and the civil rights movement and ending desegregation and uh, the de jure uh, discrimination uh, was broadened uh, to see the economic linkages and the foreign policy linkages and the military linkages, because oh, one, of, one of the uh, incredible uh, developments uh, for Robert, uh, as with Martin Luther King, was that uh, the Vietnam War was drawn into this. Uh, the global scene, uh, Robert Kennedy takes a remarkable trip to mm -hmm. South Africa in 1966. Uh, but there's a war going on at the same time, the US uh, uh, war in Vietnam. Could you talk about how the agenda just kept becoming larger and larger? It was uh, incredible. No, it, it, all those points are so critical. Just briefly, the, war, the Vietnam War. I mean, when Lyndon Johnson becomes president, the war becomes an American war. We send ground troops. I mean, the war has been going on, American involvement escalating across decades. but. After uh, 64, it really becomes an American war. And, and so there's the war and protest against war. And then the war is taking the money that should be going to anti-poverty programs. Uh, as Dr. King said, the bombs in Vietnam are exploding at home, right? So you have a shrinking anti-poverty program as, as the cities are really uh, uh, demanding and needing this attention. And the Vietnam War is, uh, it's, it's terrible. I mean, you know, and Kennedy and King both see the immorality of that war. And so their resistance, their efforts to fight racism and, and poverty also put them on the front lines of opposing America's war in Vietnam and challenging, directly challenging it and aligning with the anti-war movement, which is growing during this period. So this tremendous, uh, yeah, it's it, it's so uh, poignant, by the way, because uh, Martin Luther King's uh, advisors are, are telling him, "Don't get into that, Martin. You know, it's already complicated enough. You have enough problems with poor people with the uh, racial discrimination. Now you're going to take on the Vietnam War." And he goes uh, just a few blocks from where I, where I am in the northern direction, Riverside uh, Church, uh, and gives an incredible speech saying, "We cannot." solve our problems of justice at home if we are fighting an unjust war abroad. Mm -hmm. exactly. And Robert reaches the same conclusions. Totally. And so they tie together the politics in the most incredible way. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if I might, I, I wanted to uh, also read because uh, in, in, in my work, I spend a lot of time on uh, issues of uh, environment, of course, uh, and sustainable development. And we bemoan uh, the narrow economic focus. And this is again, where Robert Kennedy said the most beautiful thing ever said about the issue of uh, 
how we need a broad vision and measurement of uh, what we're after. Uh, if I could just uh, uh, say for uh, listeners, because it's another great speech that he gave in the 1968 presidential campaign, when he talked about the, the gross national product, yeah. uh, which we use as our measurement after right. all for what's good. But listen to Robert Kennedy's words, everybody, when he says, yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit, nor our courage, nor our wisdom, nor our learning, neither our compassion, nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. Beautiful. Unbelievable. It's just, no, it gives me goosebumps. So <laughs> it gives me goosebumps reading it. No, so true. No, it, it, he really got to the heart of the matter and, um, and used his platforms to, uh, to reach people and explain it in that way. I mean, that is a powerful way to think about, you know, and he also talked about life is short, even when it's long, you know, we're here. Why are we here? How do we want to live together? What kind of society do we want to really live in? And, and really important questions in this moment. Um, Jeff, you mentioned the trip to South Africa. And I think, you know, Kennedy did have a global vision. And, and as, as Marion Wright Edelman said about him, he went, he saw, he listened, he grew. He went to Latin America as a senator and really got out, walked around. I mean, saw, you know, about US policy and the poverty. And the trip to South Africa is, um, is a great film about it. Um, but he was invited by students, you know, students involved in the anti-apartheid movement. The government didn't want him to come, but they figured they better let him because he might be president someday. Uh, but he couldn't bring any U.S. press with him. And he uh -huh. spent five days. Yeah, so they- but, I didn't yeah. know that. Interesting. Yeah. I forgot That's how that. They, they wouldn't let King come. King was invited. They said, absolutely not, no visa. But they let Robert Kennedy come in that five days. And he talked about our countries, I mean, he related what our country had gone through and was going through in terms of racial inequality and South Africa and the power of resistance and protest. You know, I mean, because things were really dark when he went there in 1966, I think it was 65, no, 66. Um, but, you know, and the students who brought him said that, I mean, he just, he went everywhere. He talked to everyone. As Mark, Mark said, he, went, he, he said it straight. He went straight to the people. He didn't just, you know, because government officials wouldn't meet with him anyway. But um, and he gave some remarkable speeches, but speeches that really spoke about, you know, acknowledging the challenges, but the nature of the struggle and the importance of it. And she said words like justice, dignity, uh, democracy, things we had not heard for an eternity. Um, so that, uh, and by the end of his speech, I mean, his trip, everybody was coming out to see him, you know, Africanas, I mean, he reached out and touched yeah. everyone and really surprised people. They thought it would be a political, no, it was, he was going to see and embrace and, and connect and talk about what matters for human beings and our connectedness and, and about race and the barriers of race and the, and the really destructiveness of that. So um, he moved could, on a world stage, yeah. Could you say a, a word uh, about, uh, for me, just unbelievably powerful and poignant remarks that he gave uh, in Indianapolis the night that Martin Luther King was, was killed? Because mm. I can't recall another impromptu uh, set of remarks anywhere in any context as powerful as those yeah. words. That night, well, by, by that month, April of 68, he was in Indiana running for president, uh, running, and he heard he was flying to Bloomington, I mean, from Indianapolis from Muncie, and he, they got word that Dr. King had been shot in Memphis. And um, when they landed in Indianapolis, they found that he was, he was dead. And Robert Kennedy was just, uh, well, everybody was just shocking. And John Lewis, the great civil rights leader, had set up a meeting for uh, Robert Kennedy in the sort of African-American community in Indianapolis, separated, separate. 
And uh, so he gets off the plane and the police chief said, you can't go there, it's not safe. And Robert Kennedy said, if you don't feel safe going, he said, my family and I could go to that community and lay down in the street and go to sleep and be perfectly safe. If you don't feel safe, that's your problem, we're going. And he sent Ethel <laughs> to the hotel. And, and the amazing thing for your listeners, I mean, you know, back then, no cell phones, right? people had not heard. Most people had not heard that Dr. King was killed. These people had gathered waiting for him. Some people on the edges had heard, most people had not heard. And when he, by the time he got there, it was dark, it was about nine o'clock at night. He got on the back of a flatbed truck and he asked somebody, have they heard? And they said, no. And he told them. And it's just, this is film. People can watch this. You hear the gasp in the oh. crowd, that shocking gasp, because he, they're cheering him and he's saying, quiet, quiet. And they're cheering and he says, quiet. And then he tells them, and there's a, this audible gasp and then silence. And then silence. And then he talks about Dr. King and what Dr. King represented and what direction we were gonna go in. Um, you know, what, in sort of a moment of choice in a, such a horrific time and he understood, it's the first time he ever mentioned his brother's and only time in public, he mentioned his brother's assassination because he said to the mostly African-American crowd, it seems that a white man did this. And you may want to feel anger towards all white people but I had lost someone close to me and he was killed by a white person. You know, we can go into greater division or we can try to come together. And it just, and again, he, he really pulled on King's life and what King represented and, uh, and what we as a country, black and white, had to really do to move forward. And it, it was, I mean, people at that speech, John Lewis writes about it in his memoir. I mean, it, it just it just pulled people in and, and gave them a sense of hope in a really horrible moment of loss. I mean, deep loss. Um, and people, you know, there was not, there were no uh, uprisings in Indianapolis in the wake of King's assassination, but across the country, cities just exploded. Um, but it was. Uh, they could beautiful. unite people. This is. He could unite people and, and in a real way. JFK and RFK, both of them could inspire people to their greater, their greater, greater side and to the common good. No, and, exactly and that, at that night. But that moment was the testing point. Yep. And actually, that was one of the moments I had read about that made me think about Robert Kennedy in terms of this era. And so when I wrote this book, by the time I got to that I, really iconic moment, I understood you know, who he was and his ability, no notes, he just got up and spoke from his heart um, to the people and, and really say a prayer for our country and for the family of Martin Luther King. Pat, in our remaining minutes, <laughs> I, 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 I don't wanna say, so where are we today? <laughs> because that will take us uh, for hours to, to go. Yeah. But can I ask you, uh, you're a professor at University of South Carolina. South Carolina has played uh, a role in these struggles uh, mm -hmm. for centuries. It was uh, the center of the Confederacy. Uh, it uh, is, uh, has had a history of sending some of the most racist to people to the US. What is the what is the situation today from the vantage point of South Carolina looking outward to our divided country? Are we gonna hmm. pull through? How can we unite? Where can RFK's vision uh, take us beyond the divisions? You know, I mean, South Carolina is a great example as to, right now I'm in Massachusetts. <laughs> You're in Massachusetts, <laughs> but, but yeah. But no, 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 but I, I teach in South Carolina, but you know, South Carolina had an amazing civil rights struggle there and leadership that came out of the black community in South Carolina. But I, where I take hope is what we saw in Georgia. We have to get to work ourselves. We, we're all talking about how terrible things are and they're pretty bad. 
but what are you going to do? And that was Robert Kennedy. You know, people remember his speeches, but what's supposed to is what he did. He said, people like me can go around giving nice speeches. That's great. He goes, but what are we going to do? And then he did the Bedford Stuyvesant project to try to work with that community. So I think that's the lesson is that, you know, the 60s were very challenging times and people found a way to act. And even though we didn't change everything, it really left a legacy. It made critical openings and showed us it's a long haul, right? I mean, but I think what they did in Georgia and some of these organizing voters, grassroots, building, building, moving forward. And South Carolina is a small state. So I really, <laughs> we need to get busy because, you know, there are a lot of good people in South Carolina and that's what the Kennedys understood. There are good people everywhere. How do you get them motivated to take responsibility, take action? And that's our, that's our greatest hope. And I think that is the most powerful legacy of this history is in their time, what they faced, how they moved and interacted and did what they could. And, and we all are, in, you know, everybody has to be part of this. I mean, they understood that from Washington, you know, building support for the Civil Rights Act. So I think in South Carolina, you, you've given me a challenge here, <laughs> but to even work harder, because I think what we saw in Georgia can be duplicated if we get really work hard continuously on civic engagement, voting, political participation, um, and also just education that people need to understand history. As Baldwin said, if you don't understand what happened behind you, you have no idea what's going on around you. <laughs> and I think um, that's oh, also- oh, Pat, <laughs> on behalf of everybody, let me thank you for helping us understand uh, what happened behind us so that we can understand what's going on around us. This is a wonderful book uh, and uh, you've uh, given us, uh, I think a very, uh, practical and powerful message from the book to get active, to work for social justice, to build on, uh, on the legacies of uh, what uh, Robert Kennedy uh, and John Kennedy and Martin Luther King and the other Malcolm X and the other leaders of the 1960s uh, mm -hmm. contributed to uh, creating a, a country that we want. This is a fantastic read. So please, uh, everybody, uh, justice rising. Robert Kennedy's America in Black and White. Pat, it's a privilege uh, to have you uh, with us. I want to thank you on behalf of all of the listeners. And I'd like to uh, let everybody know that our next conversation will continue in a way with the chronological history uh, of the U.S. because we're going to be speaking with uh, Rick Perlstein, uh, who okay. is uh, writing a fantastic series of Mm -hmm. uh, books that uh, take us through the white backlash era, if I might, from uh, the uh, uh, election of Richard Nixon through the 1970s. And we're going to be talking about his book, uh, Reaganland, America's Right Turn, 1976 to 1980. So this is another swing of the pendulum that we're going to be talking about, but very important for us to understand uh, our situation today. So that is on 27th of July, please join. And once again, Pat, thank you so much for the privilege of uh, spending an hour talking about your wonderful book, Justice thank Rising. Thank you so much. And thanks to all who, who tuned in. And thanks very much, Jeff. Great to be with you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.